I told you it's been 25 good years. And I mean that. And I thank God for my lovely wife. At this time, put your hands together for Evangelist Van Williams. for yet another day to be able to give you glory, honor, and praise. God, we thank you for this is the day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. God, we bless your name. We give you glory and we give you honor because you're worthy. You're worthy of the praise. You're worthy of the glory, and you're just worthy of all the praise. God, I thank you, God, for the man of God, God, we thank you for the opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk, God. Bless them on tonight, God. Bless the First Lady, God, as she gives the convocation tonight. God, we pray for your people of God. God, bless them, oh God. Read the tables of their hearts, God, and answer their prayer requests, God. We thank you, God. For God, we pray that you bless this word on tonight. God, anoint these lips of clay. I pray that I do no damage to thy word, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine. God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands for Jesus and give God the praise. We give honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on tonight. Thank you, Jesus. We give honor to our bishop on tonight and his absence and to the first lady. We give honor to Elder Robert Williams on tonight. And to my children, I give honor. And to all of you, God's people, I give honor. You may have your seats. I bless the Lord for my husband on tonight. He's right. I said there were some hiccups. But I thank the Lord that those hiccups has made us better. And I'm so grateful to be able to stand here and say that we are about to celebrate 25 years of marriage and to God be the glory for the things that he has done. We are going to the book of James. We're going to pull the theme scripture on tonight and we're going to chapter 4 verse 7. If you pray with me, I promise I won't be before you long. And the word of the Lord reads, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. My topic on tonight, look at your neighbor and say, fighting for God's truth. We have all been familiar with the term opposites attract, right? It's when there's a tendency to connect with someone who is not like ourselves. And we can relate. I know I can. I would venture to say that my husband is pretty much my opposite. For example, he loves the cold, I love the hot. He prefers to stay up late and I prefer to rise early. He's an introvert while I'm an extrovert. Opposites. In the natural, despite being opposites, we fell in love, got married, and have been together for almost 25 years. But how many of you know that sometimes that which is in the natural may not always be that which is in the spiritual? For James tells us that opposites do not attract. For according to our text, we cannot submit to God while at the same time not resist the devil. For in order to truly submit to God, we must resist the devil. Why? Because these factors are two opposing forces. And by its very definition of the text, you cannot be for one and not against the other. Allow me to relate this to sports. For those of us who are college basketball fans, we know that by the sheer definition of the word fan, you can't be a Duke fan and a UNC fan at the same time. These are two opposing forces. Or right now, even in our household, you can't be a LeBron James fan and a Stephon Curry fan at the same time. Again, these are two opposing forces. For those who aren't sports fans, but maybe you are a Believe the Bible fan, and for those of us who believe the Bible, then we know you can't be for same-sex marriage and yet still believe in traditional marriage. Or you can't openly profess pro-life 
while secretly believing that a woman really does have the right to choose. Look at your neighbor and say opposites do not attract. For Matthew 6 and 24 states that no man can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or else hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And yes, we want to resist the devil as it relates to vices that we can't seem to overcome. For Jeremiah 12 and 5 tells us, if thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? You see, it's necessary that we lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is before us. We've been talking about putting the devil on the run. Well, that starts with all areas in our lives that we know we need to grow from, that we need to get right with God. It starts with resisting, that is opposing the devil. And the Bible says if we do, the Bible guarantees us that he will flee. And although James also tells us in verse 1 that the enemy is within ourselves, and yes, we can sometimes be our own worst enemies, how many of you know that there is another enemy warring against our flesh? And that enemy is the war against God's truth. We've heard the old adage that the devil is in the detail. And we've been seeing an attack from the enemy to desensitize our thinking towards the truth. Look at how our nation is being indoctrinated to believe that homosexuality is morally acceptable. When God's truth tells us in Leviticus 20 and 13 that it's abomination before God. And then there's the supposedly education lottery that's sweeping our states. And Christians are rushing to buy tickets and scratch-offs, hoping to win big, when the truth tells us in Proverbs 10 and 2 that treasures of wickedness profited nothing. How about the fact that we elect government officials who do not pass God's litmus test for being qualified leaders when Matthew 7 and 15 tells us to beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And then there's the fact that we've kicked God out of the public school system and replaced Christianity with false religion of evolution. When the truth tells us in Genesis 1 and 1 that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And how about the fact that we mindlessly sit through immoral filth that is embedded through television programs like Empire and Scandal when the truth of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 and 33 that evil communications corrupt good manners. Through the tolerance movement, this nation embraces and elevates the Muslim religion while attacking and even killing Christians who refuse to take down but the truth tells us in Amos 3 and 3 that two cannot walk together except they be agreed. And we can't fail to mention HB2, where a government expects my girls to share the restroom with perverted men when God's truth tells us in Genesis 1 and 27 that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him Male and female created he them. Look at your neighbor and said, there's a war against God's truth. So it's time for us as believers to resist the devil's tricks, schemes, and devices that war against the truth of God and see the enemy for what and who he is. It's time for us, according to Ephesians 6, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You see, this is bigger than our vices, our pet peeves, and even our sins. The real enemy is against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's time for us to resist the devil and to fight back against the war of God's truth. So how do we fight back? Well, I'm glad you asked, because Ephesians 6 tells us, to put on the whole armor of God. That is to girt up our loins about with truth, to put on the breastplate of righteousness, and to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then Paul says, but above all of these, he says, take on the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, 
which is the word of God. Look at your neighbor and say, that's God's truth. But how many of you know that in order to fight the enemy with God's truth, we have to know what the truth says? Therefore, Timothy admonishes us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. Why? So that we can rightly divide the word of truth. So that when the enemy rears its ugly head, we've already studied in the book of Isaiah that when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. When the enemy reveals himself as an angel of light, we've already studied in the book of 1 John that the truth tells us to believe not every spirit, but to try the spirits whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. When the enemy creates dissension and infighting amongst one another, we've already studied in the book of 2 Corinthians that tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. When the enemy whispers in your ear that you've been defeated, you've already studied in the book of Isaiah that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Look at your neighbor and say, study God's truth. And how many of you know, if you fight, you can't fight for God's truth and he not fight for you. For the same truth that gives us power to resist the devil is the same truth that tells us in the book of Ephesians that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. So no matter what the devil throws your way, stand on the truth of God. Why? Because the truth tells us in the book of Numbers that God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Had they not said it, and shall he not do it? Had they not spoken, and shall he not make it good? And since his word cannot lie, we can rest in the fact that all the promises of God are in him, yea, and amen. In other words, God said it, that settles it, and I believe it. And I don't know about you on tonight, but I'm standing on the promises of God so that when my body is wrecked with pain, the truth tells me that he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon him, and by his stripes, I'm already healed. When my back is against the wall, the truth of God tells me that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us out of them all. The truth of God is a rock and a refuge. The truth of God is our hiding place. Despite this world's condition, we know that God's truth prevails. And while you're waiting on God to come through for you, while you're waiting for God to answer your prayers, our leader told us on Sunday night to continue working, to continue fighting, stay steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because how many of you know that your labor will not be in vain? How many of you know that if you, if you stay with God, God will remember you. God has not forgotten you despite where you are because weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Look at your neighbor and say good morning. God will remember you despite where you are, despite what you see. Our leader often says you got to see it before you can see it so that you can see it. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to wait till the battle is over before I can see it. I'm going to give God praise. I'm going to give God glory because I believe the report of the Lord. I believe God's truth. And God's truth says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. God's truth says if you delight yourself in you, he'll give you the desires of your heart. God's truth says Cap your hands for Jesus if you believe in God's truth.